where he wrote his system. Okay, let's play some damn chess! The city of the sun. Now, this city is important for many reasons, but one of those is that there was a priest here who lived in the 4th and 3rd century BC named Manetho, Street who was one of the foremost historians for ancient Egypt. And in his writings, Manetho tells us that the pharaoh of the Exodus was someone named Amenhotep. The pharaohs that are named Amenhotep were found in the 18th dynasty, and so in the 18th dynasty, you have Amenhotep the first, second, third, etc. And so, which one of these is the one that Manetho is referring to? And the best way to figure this out is to use the biblical date of the Exodus, which is found in 1 Kings 6.1. 1 Kings 6 1 says, In the 480th year after the Israelites came out of Egypt, in the fourth year of Solomon's reign over Israel, in the month of Ziv, the second month, he began to build the temple of the Lord. So there's 480 years between these two events, when the Israelites came out of Egypt, the Exodus, and the fourth year of Solomon's reign. It's very well established that the fourth year of Solomon's reign is 966 B.C. So to get the date of the Exodus, all we have to do is add 480 years to 966 B.C. and we get 1446 B.C., which is the biblical date of the Exodus. Now we can turn our attention Come on, back slut. to the Egyptian chronology. Stop the damn game! simple question. Is there a pharaoh named Amenhotep that is reigning during the biblical date, 1446 you B.C. Amenhotep I. From China? 1546 to 1526. His reign is too early. Amenhotep III reigned too late. From 1414 to 1377 B.C. In between them, Amenhotep II reigned from 1450 to 1423. And so the biblical date of 1446 B.C. for the Exodus falls God within the reign of Amenhotep II. The Amenhotep that Manetho was writing about must be Amenhotep II because the dates of his reign are in sync with the biblical date of the Exodus. There's additional information from other verses in the Bible that can also be used to further test Amenhotep II. For example, in Exodus, it talks about the Pharaoh that reigns before the Exodus Pharaoh, and he is often referred to as the Pharaoh of the Oppression. In the book of Exodus, we that Pharaoh tried to kill Moses, but Moses fled from Pharaoh and went to live in Midian. During that long period, the king of Egypt died. The Lord to Moses and Midian, go back to Egypt. In the New Testament, in Acts chapter 7, Stephen is retelling how Moses fled to Midian. But then, after 40 years had passed, he returned to Egypt. We can test this then with Amenhotep II. Did the predecessor of Amenhotep II reign for more than years? I see a dick in your future. I see a dick. was his father, Thutmose the Third. And Thutmose the Third had a reign of 54 years. He's the only pharaoh in the 18th dynasty that had a reign for more than 40 years. So Amenhotep II passes this test. Exodus 11.5 says of the tenth plague that every firstborn son in Egypt will die, including the firstborn son of Pharaoh, who sits on the throne. If Amenhotep II is the Exodus Pharaoh, then his firstborn son should have died in the tenth plague. And so the successor of Amenhotep II is his son, Thutmose IV, who is not God his firstborn son. His firstborn son died mysteriously, we know from the Egyptian records. God fucking damn it. God fucking damn it. We know God from the bucket. Egyptian records. is his son, Thutmose IV, who is not his firstborn son. His firstborn son died mysteriously, we know from the Egyptian records. <laughs> Kiss that night goodbye, slut from China! This is the Suck Greek Sphinx slut. in Giza. And between the paws of the Sphinx is what's called the Sphinx Dream Stele, 
This was commissioned by Pharaoh Thutmose IV, who told a story about he came down to the Sphinx, he took a nap, and while he was sleeping, the gods came to him in a dream, and they promised to him that he would become the next Pharaoh. This was strange because he had an older brother who was the crown prince, but this older brother had mysteriously died and disappeared from history. This was propaganda. He used the gods to give him divine legitimacy when he wasn't expected to become the next Pharaoh. So we have uh, Amenhotep II passing these tests, these biblical criteria, because uh, his predecessor reigned for over 40 years, and the one who succeeded him to the throne was not his firstborn son. Next, we travel deep into the region of the Delta, to the ancient site of Averis. One of the main excavators of Averis is the Austrian archaeologist Manfred Kaytok, and he's the one that excavated the 18th dynasty palace there. So we are here at Averis, and this is where the palace of Amenhotep II uh, was uh, discovered and excavated. Yeah, so it's in that corner, essentially. <laughs> This is all you can see pottery around. We can see a few foundation stones around, but this is where the 18th Dynasty Palace stood, in this field underneath our feet and behind me here. But this is, this is a palace that has been discovered. This is a palace that has been excavated. How long have they been excavating in this area? Come on, you slut that slut. And yet there's like nothing hardly to see here. Um, it's just all been turned back into agricultural fields. Yeah, mostly pottery and maps. B Talk reported that the archaeology demonstrated that the archaeologists on that wrong to do a stairway. Covers the time from Amos to Amenhotep II. This palace complex was occupied through the reign of Thutmose III and Amenhotep II when it was suddenly and mysteriously abandoned. So the excavations at the 18th Dynasty Palace in Averis provided then archaeological evidence to support Amenhotep II as the Exodus Pharaoh. Son of a bitch. One of the most impressive pharaohs in all of Egyptian history is the pharaoh Ramses II. And so it was very early on that Egyptologists started to propose that Ramses II must have some connection with the Exodus. I am here at Memphis. This is the first capital of oh, Egypt. Sucker. And below me is this colossal statue of Ramses II, who built this site up during his reign. God damn it. Now fuck up and move this poem down here. Now, the biggest problem with Ramses II being the Exodus Pharaoh is time, because uh, Ramses II did not start his reign until 1279 BC. So this is 167 years later than 1446 BC, which is the biblical date for the Exodus. And remember that the predecessor to the Exodus Pharaoh has to have a reign of more than 40 years. The predecessor of Ramses II is Seti the first, and he reigned from 1290 to 1279 BC, which is just a reign of 11 years. So he fails the test. Now Ramses II does have a very long reign of 66 years, and so is he the pharaoh of the oppression. Well, the problem here is that would make his successor, Merneptah, the pharaoh of the Exodus, and the Exodus pharaoh can't have their firstborn son inherit their throne because he would have died in the 10th plague. Uh, the successor to Merneptah is Seti II, and he is his firstborn son. So the reason that Ramses II can't be connected to the Exodus is because he fails all these tests. If he failed just one of these criteria, then he would be disqualified as a candidate, but he fails on all counts. So now I'm going to give my general views of the debate that's been going on for a long time between the early date and the late date. The early date for the Exodus is in the 15th century BC. The late date is in the 13th century BC. And this is Amenhotep II versus Ramses II as Pharaoh of the Exodus. So the main verse that's used for the late date is Exodus 111. And here we have the Israelites 
under its slave masters who build a store city named Ramses. And so the idea is that this city named Ramses is connected to the pharaoh Ramses II, and therefore the Exodus must date to his time. Mars was established in the 12th dynasty, but in the 19th dynasty to the north, a new city and palace emerged called P. Ramses. Now in the book of Exodus, we see that one of the store cities that's built is called Ramses. Some have explained this as rival updating later on, but there's a possibility that this area was also called Ramses during the Egyptian dynasty. Now it's important to understand that Exodus 1.11 is not in conflict with the early date. So even if the name Ramses is a late name for the city, it's still not a problem for the early date because Get that the Bible not out of uses you. later names for cities in place of earlier ones. A good example of this is the city of Dan. In Judges 18, we have the Danites capture and rebuild the city, and then they name it Dan after their ancestor, though it formerly been called Laish. Uh, then we can go back in time, and go back to Genesis 14, 14, which tells us that Abram went as far as Dan. So we have a clear example of the later name for the city, Dan, replacing the earlier name Laish. Uh, and, and this, this is done, done because the Israelites were more familiar with the name Dan. Now fuck that Dan. king right here. And so, so this, this is what may be going on in Exodus 1.11. It's time to Jan Ez Uzi. Where we have possibly the later name for Jan the city Jan of Ramses being Jan used Uzi. instead of the earlier name. Just as we wouldn't date Abram using the name of the city Dan in Genesis 14.14, 14, so we shouldn't date the Exodus by the name of the city Ramses in Exodus 1.11. The main verses we've already covered for the early date is 1 Kings 6 1. This is a real problem for the late date. And so the way that they uh, argue against 1 Kings 6 1 is they say that the 480 years that's mentioned there uh, should be. It's not a literal number. Uh, what this is really talking about, they argue, is 12 generations of 40 years. But then they say 40 years is too long for a generation that really should be 25 years. Ah! Times 25 is 300 years. So if you reduce 480 years in 1 Kings 6 1 down to 300 years, then you've moved uh, the whole chronology 180 years later in time, and then it fits the reign of Ramses II. Before the late date theory came along, nobody read 1 Kings 6 1 and, and read 480 years and said, oh, I, I get it, that really means 300 years. This is a reinterpretation of this verse, and it's agenda-driven. So what's the agenda? The agenda is to make Ramses II the pharaoh of the Exodus. Now there's another problem with the late date with Judges 11.26. So in Judges 11.26, we have Jephthah, who says, For 300 years Israel has occupied the land east of the Jordan. This took place around 1100 B.C. When you add 300 years to 1100 B.C., you get 1400 B.C. Add the 40 years of wilderness wandering, and then you get this mid-15th century B.C. date for the Exodus, which is an agreement with the mid 15th century date of the Exodus from 1 Kings 6 1. So this Judges 11 also gives a 15th century BC date for the Exodus, then the late date scholars have to present their arguments against it. So what they say is that Jephthah is unreliable. And the reason that they give is that he calls in verse 24 the name of the Ammonite god Kamosh. Whereas later in the Bible, for example, in uh, 1 Kings 11.5, the name of the Ammonite ah, god is see given a dick as Moloch. So Jephthah ah, can't be trusted. He gives the wrong name of the god of the Ammonites. And so therefore, in verse 26, when he says it's 300 years, you can't trust that 300 years is being ah! Well, this is, this is actually from Jephthah, uh, very important information about the Ammonites. He's telling us that earlier in their history, they worshipped the god Kamosh, which makes sense because the god that the Moabites worship, and the Ammonites and the Moabites are brother nations uh, that come from Lot. And so um, they worshipped uh, early in their history. Kamosh, and then later they changed and adopted, for whatever reason, the worship of the Amorite god Moloch. Well, historically, nations sometimes change their gods. Some examples of this is Babylon. 
Babylon changed their god. Nebuchadnezzar worshipped Marduk, and then Nabonidus led the people to worship the god Sin. Egypt changed its god during the reign of Akhenaten, and the Israelite prophets are almost constantly rebuking the Israelites for changing their god, right? Because they've forsaken their god who delivered them out of Egypt and are worshipping these other gods. So this is not any kind of proof. Uh, that that uh, Jephthah is being unreliable when he gives us the number 300. And again, these two uh, verses, 1 Kings 6, 1 and Judges 11, 26, complement each other. They confirm each other. It's very powerful evidence. And this is the same argument that these scholars use against Acts chapter 7 and the testimony of Stephen. He's unreliable. He's untrustworthy. They need to say this because Stephen gives information uh, that contradicts Ramses the second as being the Pharaoh of the Exodus because he says that Moses returns to Egypt after 40 years had passed, which means that the predecessor, as we've looked at already, uh, of the Exodus Pharaoh needs to have reigned for more than 40 years, and the predecessor for Ramses the second only reigned for 11 years. So they say the same thing. Well, Stephen's testimony is unreliable. It can't be trusted. And that's just simply not the case. So Manetho is a big problem for the lady. I just shit in my pants. Uh, because he doesn't name Ramses as the pharaoh of the Exodus. He names Amenhotep. Uh, so guess what the late date scholars say about Manetho? You guessed it. He's unreliable. Uh, and so the argument that they use against him is that uh, there's these variants. Now, of course, uh, for many ancient sources and ancient texts, there's later variants. Um, that's why we have textual criticism, uh, which is identifying those variants and trying to get as close as possible to the original. The general understanding for ancient texts is the earlier texts are usually considered more reliable than the later ones. And so of all the historians that quote Manetho, by far the earliest is Josephus, and everything that we have out of directly here. out of Josephus. Uh, the other problem with Manetho being unreliable is that um, to this day, the framework for, uh, for the history, laying out the history of ancient Egypt with these 30 dynasties that ruled over Egypt, uh, that all comes from Manetho. And so it really doesn't work just to write Manetho off as being unreliable. And in addition to all of this, we have the archaeology from Averis, which shows that the 18th dynasty palace came to an end during the reign of Amenhotep II. Uh, the palace of the 19th dynasty in P. Ramses uh, didn't start with Ramses II, nor did it end after his reign. Really, uh, the reality is, is that the evidence for the date and the pharaoh of the Exodus is stacked on the early date side. God damn it. This is the mummy of Amenhotep II, and the evidence is clear that he was the pharaoh of the Exodus. What is the archaeological evidence for pharaoh of the Exodus? What is the archaeological evidence for the Exodus? Well, here's something. Uh, the mummy of Amenhotep II. According to the evidence, when you're looking at the mummy of Amenhotep II, you're looking at the very man who dealt with Moses, who hardened his heart and wouldn't let God's people go, who went through the ten plagues. This is the Pharaoh who God delivered his people from. So don't forget to hit that subscribe button. I'll leave a link in the description where you can order a copy of my book. Uh, you can watch other videos that we produced here. And thanks for watching. I'll catch you next time. God damn it. God fucking damn it.
the spitster. Man, Hello and welcome, welcome back to Let the Stone Speak. Speak. This is the podcast where we talk about the latest in biblical archaeology. I'm here with archaeologist Christopher Ring today. Hello, Brent. Chris is one of our writers uh, for our magazine, Let the Stone Speak. This is a magazine that covers biblical archaeology. It's produced by the Arsenal Institute of Biblical Archaeology here in Jerusalem, Israel. And it's available for free if you're interested in getting yourself a copy. Our latest edition talks about the discovery of Joshua's altar up on Mount Ebal as well as, well as a, a, a curse tablet, tablet that was found there recently. And we, we also have articles that detail and revolve around, around the Exodus period because we are coming up to Pesach, the Days of Unleavened Bread. And, and Chris here has written an article entitled Searching for Egypt in Israel. And, and so, so we're, we're going, going to be talking about some of the really interesting facets of this article today. today. I, would I would like to consider your uh, really, really uh, interesting approach to... Uh, looking, looking for evidence of the Exodus. A lot of people have a different way of looking at this. Purely, I guess, looking for material evidence of the Israelites in uh, inside Egypt. But you take a different approach. Perhaps you can uh, describe how you do that in this article. Sure. Well, uh, good to be here again, Brent. Thanks, Thanks for having me on. The fuck is this and, um, when it comes to a lot of these articles that we write, uh, a lot of what we do is looking at archaeological discovery, digs, new discoveries that are being made, and how they relate to the Bible. Now, if you think about it that way, you can get a lot of information as to whether or not the Bible is accurate in its portrayal of that history, but you can't get quite as good an idea of when that history was written in the Bible. So this requires kind of the opposite approach. A deep dive into the biblical account and, and then seeing how that matches with like the existing archaeological record. And when it comes to the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, that's really a critical element. Not just did these things happen or not, but was this written about in the time period that the Bible says it was by a mosaic figure who lived in the second half of the second millennium BCE. That's a really critical part of the account. And uh, it's, it's over the past few centuries, uh, growing popularity has, has been given to the theory that the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, weren't written during the period that the Bible says Moses was on the scene, during that second half of the second millennium BCE. But in fact, it was written centuries, if not a millennium, after in the, in the first half of the first millennium BC. Uh, or, or even later, later on into the Hellenistic period, period and many even put it put the Torah after the prophets. Mm -hmm. So so this is a big question. When was the Torah written and can we find evidence of it? And putting aside the archaeological discoveries for the events, can we actually within the Torah find evidence for the time period in which it was written? And, and I think, think that's, that's, that's something that, that, that as, we'll, as we'll cover today, there's a lot of really fascinating evidence for it when you look at it that way. To see actually, putting, putting, to, a, putting to the side the discoveries relating to Israel and Egypt, what if we look for those Egyptian elements that have been transferred across language and, and things really unique to this specific second millennium BCE period in time in the Torah itself, or in other words, Egypt and Israel. So let's start that, as you say, go through some of this uh, internal evidence, I suppose, from the Bible itself, from the first five books, to show that it was written uh, around the same time period as the events purport to describe. Move, whore! century is what we would say, uh, and what you the Bible says as well. You start, start going, going through different, um, you've got, got showing how geography fits in, how the names fit in, in as well. We're, We're going to start with how some of the phraseology inside the Exodus, Exodus account and the first five books in general really uh, match with the earlier writing of this. 
Sure. sure. Well, well uh, just, just to frame, frame this conversation as well, there's a lot of debate about when the, when the, bi- when when the biblical exodus took place, the, the, the debate about was it 15th century, was it 13th century. century. So, so in general, for this article, I've kept it to the New Kingdom, kingdom period. period. So, so you said this argument is not going to... Right. Place. So, so the, the New Kingdom, kingdom period basically covers from 1550 BCE to about uh, 500, 500 years later, 1050, 1075. So that's, so that's the New Kingdom, kingdom period in Egypt, Egypt's, Egypt's history, which would include oh, both, uh, both theories. So in general, we're looking for corroboration if, if, if the description of Egypt, the description of these events, the description, the, the, the use of phraseology matches with this time period. And as you mentioned, the first, uh, the first subject I get into in this article is phraseology. And... Um, there's, There's a, lot a lot of great study, study on this subject that has been done by Professor Kitchen, Professor Hoffmeyer, um, Benson and Hess that I quote in, in this in this article, and and some of it relates to this phraseology, especially to the phraseology in the Torah. So, for example, you've got the ubiquitous use of uh, the enemy being destroyed by a mighty and outstretched arm. Or by a mighty right hand, mm-hmm. and, that's and that's a really, really interesting phrase because it is only used in an Exodus context. It's used throughout the Bible in, in large part in in the Torah, but it's only used in an Exodus context. Context, and you could ask yourself, well, that could be used for any context, really, destroying your enemy by a powerful and mighty right hand. So why? Uh, it gets the, the question, question going, why is it just used in this context of an exodus? Well, it turns out that this is a, this is a key Egyptian phrase of the New Kingdom period. So this phrase sort of comes into vogue in the early part of the second millennium BCE. You start to see it there with the, um, the Middle Kingdom period in Egypt. But it becomes a very popular pharaonic phrase during specifically the New Kingdom period. period. There's pharaohs that are called um, names that include that, that element, the, the, the mighty arm or the mighty, the mighty hand. Come on, slut the mighty hand. There's poetry and, and that type of thing that uses this reference. So you see this really key, in, in this case, this really key phrase that matches with its use during the, specifically the New Kingdom period. But, but it's really neat because in the Bible you see it flipped on its head. You see God praised for destroying the Pharaoh with his mighty and outstretched hand. Right. So you see, you see it flipped like that, but also the use of that phrase really is uh, quite a neat shadow to what was a common phrase at that time period. Now another example is the destroying of your enemies like chaff or like stubble. And this this uh, descriptor, this, this phrase as well, is only found in New Kingdom period Egypt. Only found in New Kingdom period Egypt. It's not found in any other kind of archaeological context anywhere else. I believe it's uh, from the Kadesh poem from the New Kingdom period, um, the 13th century BCE. As a reference to and we see this phrase appear in the Bible from the book of Exodus onwards, Mm -hmm. from Exodus 15. So So you've got got some some really key key phrases that are specific to a, a, that that, that go back to a very specific time period in Egyptian Egyptian history. And And then then when when you look at the wider accounts, so take Deuteronomy, for for example, the book of Deuteronomy, um, the, as As we we mentioned at the top of this program program, it's kind of come come into vogue that maybe maybe this was a later book book. maybe Maybe 7th century it was was kind of imagined and some of the the skeptics point to uh, the conclusion of the book of Chronicles Deuteronomy 34 it talks about Moses' death and burial and they're like well how could Moses have written that about his death and burial it's obviously the Torah wasn't written by Moses which, which no one's saying that Moses wrote that. That's right. obviously a, an editorial edition later on. Uh, but, but when you take, take the book of Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy as a whole 
and compare it to texts throughout the ancient, ancient world. Deuteronomy is Moses' final address to the people of Israel. Ah, fuck it is, it's, uh, he, he's laying out uh, his final wishes, commands to the people of Israel. And what's really neat about the book of Deuteronomy is it matches clearly 2nd millennium BCE, late 2nd millennium BCE, treaties that have been found all throughout Mesopotamia, the Levant, especially those found uh, belonging to the Hittite Empire. There's quite a few that have been found and preserved from them from the second half of the second millennium BCE. And the layout of these treaties, these suzerainty treaties, they God matches exactly with the book of Deuteronomy, starting out with the preamble, going through a historical background, treaty stipulations, invocation of witnesses, onto a deposition of a written copy of the treaty, and then concluding with curses and blessings for obedience or disobedience to that treaty. And Professor Kenneth Kitchen, he went through nearly 40 different examples of these treaties or similar such that directly match to the book of Deuteronomy. And based on that, he says, there's no way that this was some imagined um, account, strip, whatever, from the mid-first millennium BCE. This is clearly a text from the late second millennium BCE. So that's some of the broader uh, context in which it was written, I suppose, the phraseology as well. And go on to talk about the geography uh, that, that the, the first five books, books of the Bible uh, mention and how that too reveals an intimate knowledge of Egypt and an Egyptian perspective uh, when how it's written rather than, let's say, a Judean perspective reflecting back. Could you give some examples of that? Right, so if, 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 this, if the Torah was written by, a, by Ju- late Judean authors, you would expect them to have a better knowledge of Judah and the geography there and kind of more of a hazy uh, image of Egypt at this time. But instead we find exactly the opposite which fits directly, directly with, with the biblical account. A mosaic figure who was born in Egypt, grew up in, in that, that kind of princely setting, but yet wasn't allowed to enter the promised land. So we see the, we see the reverse in, in the Torah. And that matches with discoveries on the ground as well. And several, several points mentioned in the Torah would be totally redundant to a late writer or a more, more Judean familiar writer. Like you've got um, descriptions of the, the land of Canaan mentioned in, in reference to what they're like, to pl- what places are like in Egypt. Mm-hmm. So, so this place in Canaan, which is a lot like this place in Egypt, you've got uh, like one most arbitrary statement that Shechem is, uh, Genesis 33 verse 18 says that Shechem, which is in the land of Canaan. Well, obviously Shechem is in the land of Canaan. For a late writer, writer that's, that's like your most major city. It'd be like saying New York, which is in the land of America. Right. Um, for, for late, late writers, writers, that would just be the most redundant statement. But for a figure writing in God, the 2nd millennium BC, an Egyptian-based figure, that, that just God, makes sense. You've got several, several statements like that. And, and then, then the familiarity as well with, with particulars God, about God. Egypt. So the author of the Torah knows that, that you could put a basket in the Nile River and it'd be fine with the child in it. You couldn't, couldn't do that with the Jordan River for at least a, at least a, least a good, good portion of the year. Mm-hmm. Um, you've, you've got the, the author of the Torah, Torah mentioning gardening practices in Egypt and how different it is it, or it would be from the, the practices in Canaan or the more natural practices because you get more rainfall in Canaan, so you don't need to have all of these gardening practices specific to Egypt. Uh, so you've got a lot of really neat particulars like that. And even the, the things that aren't mentioned. So Jerusalem is nowhere mentioned in the Torah. Nowhere mentioned by that name. But it's mentioned nearly a thousand times throughout the rest of the Bible. So if late authors were writing about it, why didn't they use this Bucking name in the Torah, Torah because, because the Torah, Torah does mention the region that includes Jerusalem, Genesis 14, Genesis 14, Genesis 22, but, but it, it never names it that way. It, it, it only takes on that name 
from the conquest period, from the Book of Joshua, as you've got, got the Israelites coming into the land. So, based on what is mentioned, as well as what isn't mentioned, it really fits with what the Bible says. You've got an Egyptian-centric account looking out towards Canaan versus a, a Judean-centric account, kind of with a hazy understanding of, of Egypt or an Egyptian perspective. And then, and then you also, also kind of follow on from geography, you also look at the flora and fauna that's mentioned, uh, even going as specific as to the Exodus accounts about what they were eating, what the Israelites lusted after, after uh, from, from Egypt, and, and, and that too uh, fits well within, within this context. context. Right, so regarding what the Israelites were eating, there's a passage in Numbers 11 verse 5 that talks about the Israelites longing to go back to to Egypt, Egypt and to have the leeks and the onions that they, they were eating. eating. And, and this really matches quite beautifully with the statement by Herodotus, Herodotus the Greek historian, who actually writes about travelling to Egypt and being toured around a, a pyramid in which there was an inscription on the wall of this pyramid in ancient Egyptian, Egyptian hieroglyphics that says that the workmen were fed leeks and onions so there's, there's, there's a real match with even just the food that was that, that was given to the, the Israelite slaves. But beyond that as well, you've got the you've got Leviticus 11 and I believe it's Deuteronomy 14 talking about the clean and unclean foods, kosher and non-kosher foods, and this was given to this information was, was given to the Israelites as they were leaving Egypt. And a lot, a lot of the animals, animals that, are, that, that are specifically enumerated <laughs> are native or specific to Egypt or the Sinai. None of them are native or specific to Israel. Hmm. So, so with the with Deuteronomy 14 and Leviticus 11, you've got principles for determining clean and unclean foods. But then uh, you'll remember there's a lot of specific animals, and those specifically enumerated animals are what is the Israelite slaves would have been familiar with. I can get pissed off about And witnessed in Sinai or in Egypt. Whereas you would expect the reverse if this was a late work, or even none of this information at all if this was a late work, um, uh, written during the first millennium BCE. Uh, you, uh, you have, have other details like materials used. So acacia wood is mentioned quite a lot in the Torah for the building of the tabernacle. And this is a wood native to Egypt and the Sinai. It's not native to Israel. And there are own, uh, I believe it's mentioned several dozen times throughout the Bible. Most of which are in the Torah. I think, I think 30 times in the Torah and then four times elsewhere. And in those times where it is mentioned elsewhere, it's not referring to um, a, a wood in Israel. So you've got this really specific commanding of a use of wood that is the only wood you could find in this area that would enable you to build what is required in the Torah. And, and it's specific, specific to this region, region in which they actually were. So it really strains strange credulity to think that all of this was kind of made up for a thousand years after the fact. And then you go into, which I think is a really interesting part that I've always kind of been puzzled by, irked by myself, talking about some of the names that, have been, that are used in the, in the first five books, and specifically bring out the example of the very vague generic term of Pharaoh, uh, that, that is used, and you talk, talk, this, this is just one of your examples uh, in this section of the names or the lack thereof that are used uh, in the in the first five books. So, so how, how does how does that, that relate again to this uh, this new kingdom, kingdom of Egypt rather than uh, uh, later writing? Sure. Well, well, when your it comes to Pharaoh, it's a title everyone's familiar with, obviously, and it's an incredibly vexing thing for modern historians to try and figure out who on earth was the who's the Pharaoh. <laughs> and far from, from it being a sign of a clueless author, author. I mean, if, 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 if all these other things are so specific and exact that we've gone through already, finding the name, any name of a pharaoh in Egypt from this time period would be the easiest thing. Just go and get some kind of a 
pharaonic chronology and pick a pharaoh if you're making this up. It'd be the easiest thing of all these things we've discovered to get. But actually, if we look at the New Kingdom period, this would, to, to not use the specific name of the pharaoh, but to use the title of the pharaoh, this was a practice specific again to the New Kingdom period. So from the 1500s BCE onwards, you have this term pharaoh start to be used. And then, um, and then getting up to about the end of the New Kingdom period, around 1000, BCE, that, that the name falls out, and, and you have the you have the t the, the, the personal names of the pharaohs used. So if the Torah, let's just say, was written during the time of Joseph, way in the past, during the time of Abraham, you would expect uh, that would be impossible, but you would expect the pharaoh to be named. Right. And conversely, if it was written way after the fact. During the first millennium BC, you would expect the pharaoh to be named. But during this window of the New Kingdom period, you would not expect the pharaoh to be named. And that's exactly what we find. As frustrating as it can be to historians, that's exactly what we find, that the pharaoh isn't named. So you would say finding a, finding a name on the pharaoh attached to the Exodus would be like, well, that's probably a sign this was written in a later time. Right, if anything, that's a sign that, yeah, this was written in a later time. Come on, you bitch. So what about some of the other names? I think Moses' name himself is, is quite famous. God, people might know it's of Egyptian origin. Perhaps you can talk about that and then a few more. Sure. Well, Moses or Mose or Moshe in Hebrew is pretty pretty well known to link to to Egypt. God, it's a name, a name that, that, mean, that means, means born of, to be born of, and it's a name that we find quite frequently during the New Kingdom period, especially God during the New it. Kingdom period. And you find the name element in numerous other pharaohs' names or officials' God. names. You've got Tutmos, Amos, Amenos, Ramos, Rajmos, Ramses is another one. And you've even got the name by itself, some, some high officials called Moses or Moses. Um, so, so Moses is a pretty well-known example. But then you've got others as well. You've got Aaron or Ahavon in Hebrew. So uh, this, this is a pretty well-known name for, for the meaning being unclear as to what it means in Hebrew. But it matches pretty closely with an Egyptian name meaning uh, lion warrior, Ahara, or Ahara, uh, meaning lion warrior with the, with the add and suffix on the end. Come You've on, got Moses, Moses and Aaron's sister, Miriam. So the name Miriam was a common name in Egypt, meaning beloved of the god Ammon. So Mary being beloved. So perhaps Miriam was just a clipped form of Miriam. Um, from, from that dick period dick as well. So, so now you've, got, you've got these names that match quite incredibly, but, but, but as you talk about as well, uh, and as applies to these other things we've already discussed, the lack of certain names that are mentioned uh, are notable. So the name Baal. We'll play Pedicate, Pedicate, are not long! Obviously, uh, uh, during during the Judges period and onwards, basically as soon as Israel enters Canaan, don't even think about it! For Israel. Judges period, monarchical period. Baal is the big problem. Everyone's worshipping Baal. There are numerous names that include the Baal element. Yet, Yet there's, there's nothing, nothing in the Torah about, about this. If I get, if well, you can't either. During the mid first what? millennium BC, you'd, you'd expect there to be warnings about Baal, or some, some kind of link to Baal. Baal. But, but Baal, Baal is actually only mentioned, mentioned now once fuck up and overlook in the Torah. Now fuck up and bring that down here. as a place name for Canaan. Mm -hmm. So it's not specifically warned about or anything like that. Whereas you've got this. Uh, uh, near ubiquitous I uh, see a dick God, in your future. I uh, uh, see a dick. And by the same token, you've got the name of God as well. I see a dick in your future. I so uh, see a dick. From the judges period or the God, monarchical God, period, especially, yeah, the like numerous a names goes. include like, that like element. Hezekiah, Jeremiah, uh, including that, that, that name element. element. Whereas, as the historian Craig Davis writes, you have no names from the Torah. That, that include that element. element. So he, he does qualify that by saying you've got Joshua, but even Joshua's, Joshua's name was changed right. later on. 
And the explanation for that is quite easy. It's, it's given in the Torah itself. Uh, Exodus 4 and 5 talks about God revealing himself to Moses by the name Yahweh, saying that your forefathers have not known by this name. So the name for God is included throughout the Torah. But you, but you don't, don't have, have that name, name element with, with the people themselves. So this is quite easily explained by the fact that while Moses was the author of the Torah, God revealed himself to Moses by that name, but the people in general weren't aware of it to be able to be including it into their names or their place names. And we find this matching with the archaeological record as well. There was a uh, archaeology writer for Haaretz, who actually, who actually criticized this point, point saying the lack of evidence of Yahweh worship among slaves in Egypt shows that the Israelites weren't slaves in Egypt. <laughs> Whereas that actually proves the biblical account because they didn't know a God by that name and thus weren't worshipping him by that name. So if the inverse, like you said about the Pharaoh, if the inverse was the case, if you were finding this this thorough worship, worship of Yahweh, Yahweh in, in Egypt among slaves. slaves. That, that would be evidence against the Bible, Bible potentially. Right. Well, we, well, we actually have, have so much more in this article, article but we're, we're not, not going to get to it. it. Um, um, perhaps it can be something that we can tease people with so they can go and read the article themselves. This is called Searching for Egypt in Israel. Uh, written by Chris in the latest edition of Let the Stone Speak. Speak. I'll just, just this, this is your second, second uh, to, the third, third to last paragraph, paragraph of this, this, and then we'll go. It says, says who, who then should be most logically, who then should most logically be identified as the scribe of the Torah? When was its composition? Evidence for the Exodus events themselves aside, the internal linguistic data remarkably and consistently establish that the Torah was written during the late second millennium BCE. Yeah, so so this, this is something that is, I think, thoroughly uh, uh, really proven really in this article and quite a lot of really distinguished uh, Egyptologists and uh, linguistic scholars uh, related to this early period in your article. So people could definitely get a great summary of their work as well, I think, in this article. So thanks very much for joining us today, Chris. No problem. Please, everyone, if you want to receive this magazine, let us know speak. Go, Go ahead, ahead and, and write, write your emails, emails to letters at armstronginstitute.org requesting the magazine, or you can go to our website armstronginstitute.org and just go up to the top to publications and then magazine, and you can put in your own details there to make sure you get a free copy. Thanks very much for listening. Good day, spit. God. Fucking damn it. You, you're really starting to fucking piss me off. You're really starting to fucking piss me off. Stupid fucker. Really starting to fucking piss me off. Pissing me, you're really pissing me off. God fucking damn it. You fucking bitch. Man, see, you see, that fucking pisses me off. I miscalculated that fucking night. God fuck it. You see, that fucking pisses me off. God fucking damn it. God damn it. God fucking damn it. God fuck it. God fucking damn it. God fuck it. God fucking damn it. God fuck it. God fucking damn it. Suck my dick, bitch. Suck my dick, bitch.
Bitch, suck my motherfucking dick. Bitch, suck my slut. Come on, you slut. Come on, you slant out slut. Come on, you slant out slut. We'll be pancakes, pancakes all that long! You stupid motherfucker. Ah! Stupid bitch. God damn it. God fucking damn it. Ah! God damn it. Now fuck up and overlook this. I'll fuck up and move that damn... Move, you whore! Move, you moron! Now fuck up and move this bishop right here. Come on, you whore. God damn it. God fucking damn it. God, fuck it. God, fuck it. Come on, you 
Come on, you slut. Suck my slut. Fucking poem. Come on, you whoremonger. You pimp. You anti pimp. You anti pimp. You anti pimp. Come on, you whoremonger. Come on, you street, you slut. You hooker. You harlot. You whore. <laughs> Come on, you whore. Fucking pwn. You fucking pwn, you fucking bitch. Move, you slut. Now fuck up and do this work right here. Move, whore! Stupid slut. Come on, you slut. This is how I got rid of that fucking thing. Suck my slut into a stomach, you slut from China and North Korea, you whore. I should have let the fucking time run out on this bitch ass. Stunt that slut. Why in the fuck am I doing that? Yeah, now fuck up and take that pony, you dumbass. It's gonna be a fucking slaughter fest, is what this fucking shit is gonna be. Look at this fucking shit. 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 You're not so sure about that, are you, slut? It's time to dick up some poems. Ah, 
slut. I just shit in my pants. God damn it. God fucking damn it. God fucking damn it. God fuck it. God fucking damn it. Man, fuck this shit. God damn it. Sucker. God damn it. God fucking damn it. God fucking damn it. God shit fuck. God fuck it. God. Fuck it. <laughs> Bitch, you suck my motherfucking slut. Suck my slut. Suck my slut. Suck my slut. Man, god damn it. Suck my slut. Suck my slut. You stupid motherfucker. Come on, you slut. We spit, spit, spit. Suck my slut. God damn it. Man, I do not like this shit.
dick sucker. Quit this shit, you stupid bitch. Get that fucking knot out of you, slut. Well, I can fucking castle. Now I got a fucking castle, son of a bitch. Son of a bitch. Ah, I, I just unpersented the fuck out of you. You stupid bitch. Suck my dick, bitch. I'm facing that ear, your whore. I fuck his hole. Damn, you fucked up. And lost your. And lost your whore. And lost your whore. <laughs> Sucker. You fell for that like a sack of bricks. Each one with a ton of shit. Stupid bitch. Stupid fucker. Stupid fucker, you stupid fucker. Now fuck up and overlook this. Now fuck up and overlook this. <laughs> some of bit, some of some some of the bitch. You see, that fucking pisses me off. You see. That, that fucking pisses me off. You see, now that fucking pisses. Now that fucking pisses me off. You see, now that fucking pisses me off. Don't even think about it! Slut that whore eyes, four eyes, slut. You suck my dick, bitch. Don't even think about it! Ah! You either swap pores with me or I'm going to ear your rook. Now fuck up and refuse to take that whore. So, uh, you see, now that fucking pisses me off. Come on, you slut. That should piss this, piss this, piss this, piss this, piss this me off. That shit pisses me off, pisses me off. That shit pisses, 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 pisses me off. You see, that fucking pisses me off. <laughs> He's trying to dent as Uzi on me. That will not work, you slut. Come on, you slant that whore. God damn it.
God fucking damn it. Suck my dick. God damn it. God fucking damn it. God fucking damn it. God fuck it. God fucking damn it. God damn it. God fucking damn it. God fucking damn it. God fucking damn it. God fuck it. Now fuck him and try to You see, now that fucking pisses me off. Move! Move, whore! Now fuck him and move his pawn down here. Come on, you whore! I'll chase that whore to kingdom come! Don't even think about it! Slut. I'm fixing that ear, you rook! <laughs> I'm fixing that ear, you rook! I'm fixing that ear, you rook! Ah! I just eared your rook! Don't even think about it! Cause you're one stupid son of a bitch. Cause you're one stupid motherfucker. God damn it. You see, that fucking pisses me off. Now fuck up and move this knight king right here. I see a checkmate coming your way. Now that was white man's checkmate. I'm facing that ear, your other rook. I'm facing that ear, your rook. Ah! <laughs> I got one word of advice for you. Resign. <laughs> I'm fucking you up. <laughs> I'm tearing you limb from limb. I'm fucking you up. I'm fu I'm fucking you up. Okay, I'll put you. I'll put you. Goddamn shit colored butch go black ass for stalling. You don't move. 
Move! 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 Okay, how about I block your black ass? You bicycle! You shit colored nigger. Come on, you fudge sickle. You shit colored fudge sickle. I'm fucking you up. Oh, your butter is your ass so red and sore and raw from where I stuck my dick a bit. You can't sit down and finish this game. You're, you're too ass sore. You too, you're too butt hurt. I got news for you, bitch. Nor will you be able to fuck you. Nor will, be able, nor will you be able to walk straight for three whole weeks. And that ring of fire around your asshole like a hemorrhoid. All you'll be able to do is lie in bed in excruciating agony and hope of what? And hope your whore of a Chinese wife will fuck you. And hope your wife will fuck you. That right, slat that slut from China! Caught your unhappy ass the fuck back to China. Caught that goddamn coronavirus back with you and infect the whole goddamn Chinese military and government. Kill them all and let God sort them the. Kill them all and let God sort them the fuck out. That way, China cannot be a threat to the United States of America at least as long as I fucking live, or at least until I get to old age and it doesn't fucking matter if the Chinese China invades. No, for as long as I no forever. Make it forever. You're cheating, bitch. You're, you, you're hoping I'll be so eager to get on with the next game that I resign and let you win by default rather than wait here. Wait your, wait your punk ass, wait your lazy ass, black ass out. That's okay, you're never playing me again because I blocked your black ass. Shit colored butt, you shit colored bitch. You suck my dick, bitch. No keep your filthy AIDS tainted eh no keep your filthy AIDS tainted STD laced lips off of my clean dick. You are the the nearest queer bar and gay bar and you suck a dick there. And get AIDS in the process, you bitch. And get AIDS in the process, you bitch. Come on, you slut. You see, this fucking pisses me off. That's why I block people like this. Stupid bitch. Now I'm going to downvote him as a poor sport. And still I'm going to do my chant after I kick his ass. <clears throat> Man, look at this fucking shit. I basically called and I was saying that I more or less take the opposite. Ever notice that um, almost none of these female atheists of, uh, smell like spit? In fact, these male atheists stink like hell. I don't see enough evidence to convince me that the universe could have come to existence without the need of a creative being. And 
that's what we sort of talked about when we went around talking about talking about that. So, so what would be what would be evidence for you of, of something that would uh, be a natural universal outcome? Um. Well, that's <laughs> that's the thing. That's that. Yeah, that was like what evidence do you expect to see that you don't yeah, see? Right, right. Yeah, I ain't that stroke stricken retard like I used to be. I don't know, that's what I'm saying. Like, yeah, I, I ain't that stroke stricken So you don't see anything. evidence of a natural universe, but you don't know what the evidence would be that you'd expect to see for a natural universe. What's what I'm getting to? Like, my, anybody, any of my friends and family that know me, they know I have a very big, huge imagination. I always get accused of having a overactive imagination. Kind of and I can't even rack my imagination and imagine how the universe could have come into existence without some kind of higher intelligent creative being that brought it into existence. I, I just can't see how that could be possible. Okay, do you see evidence of a being that creates universes? Okay, without appealing to a personal life experience, what um, personal life experience, you do, without appealing to a personal life experience, you're saying that you do see evidence that there is a being that creates universes. Is that what I understood? Yeah. Okay, what is this evidence for the you say is responsible for universes? Oh, okay, good. That's another one of the things we talked about as well. Um, the emergence and explosion of the early Christian church under such hostile conditions. Yeah, that's not really convincing. There are things that happen strangely all through history that are expected, unexpected, whatever, big surprising things that you wouldn't really think could occur that do um, historic events that are not super, you know, some sort of weird supernatural thing. I really don't know how that would be like evidence of something that creates this universes. Guy, just like this guy. As you... Okay, well, given the Christian claim, the whole thing behind it, right? This is appealing to my, my personal life experience a little bit, but just but the natural aspect of the whole oh! personal life experience that they come with the territory of the life I live. Okay, I told you this as well in the last call, but uh, where I became a Christian, where I, Poor where I became a life of Christ, was when I was like, going in and out of custody because my late teens, the early 20s. Come on, you poor mom from China. I'll be sitting in and out of jail. Okay. And so, when hearing the Christian claim, because, you know, like, I investigated that possibility, because I heard and saw many different people who overcame criminality by giving their life to Christ, so obviously I would look at that avenue as a possibility to help me escape from a criminal life. God damn it. And when listening to the Christian claim and looking at the history, I had to ask myself... Don't even think, think about it, slut. If I was alive during that time and I stood before a judge and the judge told me all I had to do is stop stealing cars and redeem me to return to my normal life, and if I don't, he's going to feed me to the lions. Why well, stop stealing cars in a second? So... It doesn't <laughs> These people would take the You think that martyrdom in a religion means the religion's claims are all true? Oh, but see, with martyrism and any other part and any other claim in history, martyrism usually sparks a military uprising. But for the first three and a half centuries, there are tons of Buddhist martyrs who don't take up arms. That are pacifist. Some some of them even self-immolate, but they but they're not. I mean, I you haven't. I don't know how, that there's been like very much aggression in Buddhism for centuries. I mean, but they, there's definitely Buddhist martyrs. Yeah. Okay. Okay. But but I'm just saying that martyrdom is not proof of, a, of that there is a being in existence that create has that has the power to and is creating universes. I'm asking <coughs> for that. I'm not really asking about the claims in Christianity. Whether or not Christianity is true would be irrelevant to the fact that there would be a being um, that we can demonstrate uh, exists that creates universes. Like, where is that being, right? Like, if I... It, the cause, you're claiming that the, that the uh, cause is, I'm assuming, you know, what you would call God. And what I'm saying is that for something to cause other things, and I think we did discuss this, that... Um, things that do ah! cannot be the cause of other things. So, the, if a, if 
if there was a being that produced universes, it either does exist or did exist at one point. And so then the question would be where or how do we access that being or the evidence of that being's past existence? I'm not really asking about the Christian claims because whether it's a Christian God or a Muslim God or just some other being or whatever is, is kind of irrelevant to the question of where is the evidence that there, for this being? Where is it? Where would it reside? Where would we look for it? What would we expect to find? Okay. Um, okay, so this, this is what I'm saying. Okay, so what I'm saying is I see the Christian claim, the how the Christian church, how Christianity came to be, the extraordinary hostile conditions that it came up in. I see that as evidence of divine intervention, and that happened by... Okay, but what I'm saying is you keep saying there's this result that I'm claiming a God is responsible for. And what I'm saying is a God, if, unless the God exists, it's not responsible for anything. I can say that my toaster keeps burning my toast because of gremlins. But unless I can demonstrate somehow gremlins, I'm just making a claim that you know this outcome is caused by this thing that I can't even demonstrate. What I'm asking you is, can you demonstrate that this God is there to be causing these weird things that you think are impossible without a God in the Christian church, to be causing a universe that you think can't be caused without this God. You keep saying, here's the results that I think the God, and, I'm, and this God is causing this, and this God is causing that. And I'm like, if there's no God, then it's not causing any of this. So we need to separate, I'm trying to get you to separate the things that you're claiming God does. And so how do we get a look at God to determine that God does do these things that you're saying it does? Oh, okay, well, see, there, yeah, God, there's no test, there's no scientific experiment or test man can do to find God. God can only be shown if God so chooses to show himself. So you're saying well, there's no way to examine your claims that there's a God behind these things that you think, that you're just simply saying a God has to be causing it. And, and, and why? Okay, now I'm going why? to go to, why are we going to go to this next part? <laughs> but wait a minute, wait a minute, before you move on, okay, just, just look at the problem that I'm dealing with here. I'm trying to understand, but, but what I'm dealing with is, my toaster is burning the toast, gremlins keep messing with the toaster to make it burn the toast. Why would Tracy say that? And I say, because what else would be burning the toast? And you, and you start to tell me, and I say, no, I reject that. Only gremlins could be causing this. So you say, well, Tracy, do you see gremlins anywhere? And I say, well, they only, they can only be seen when they choose to manifest. So I've got a problem here because I'm asserting that these little beings are doing something, but I'm not really demonstrating the little beings. And if they don't exist, then something else is burning the toast. Whether I believe the gremlins are doing it or not is irrelevant. If I can't okay, demonstrate I gremlins, they're not burning the toast. Right. Okay, I agree. Or they may not, I don't know. Right, I agree with you there, that it could be something as simple as you have a malfunctioning to toaster that's not working properly and you just have to get the circuits God, fixed. Fuck or you. God your damn analogy, it. it could actually be invisible God gremlins that are messing with the circuitry. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying it is, I'm God saying it could be. Right, but I'm saying convince me that it's not. Jesus fucking convince Christ. Convince me that it's not. Not the gremlins. Well. God fucking damn it. I don't know if it is or not. Like, Okay, but, but do you God believe me? Do, do you think that it's reasonable for me to assert that it is? If I can't demonstrate them, and if I tell you that there's no way to examine them, and there's no way to prove that these things God are, bucket. but I'm going to continue to say that something that I can't even confirm exists okay. is causing things. I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what, Jay. If you if you're having a problem with one toaster and you look at that toaster God again, three will replace it, and you'll get a brand new toaster, and then you keep having that problem again and again and again. And every time you put a toaster in a certain geographical location in your house, it does this. But if you plug it into any other receptacle, it doesn't. Well, then I would say you have evidence that there must be something supernatural going on. Why? Or it could be that receptacle. So then if you get the receptacle, you get an electrician to look at the receptacle and fix the receptacle. God. And Bucket. look at and cross every, go into every possibility God. that the receptacle Bucket. is fine. And every time you plug this toaster in the receptacle, just with you and nobody else, it's doing something. Well, then I want to say you've got evidence that there's something else going on and it can't be explained in a naturalistic frame. Does it Bucket. mean gremlins? 
something supernatural. It doesn't have why would you think it's something supernatural? When you can't find a cause, why would you jump to supernatural? Is there evidence that the claim is supernatural? No, you've only said we haven't found a natural cause. You have not demonstrated a supernatural cause. What the okay, okay. How can you demonstrate if there's a if there's a supernatural cause if you think that everything that has everything that happens must have a natural cause? By demonstrating the supernatural. But how can you demonstrate God the supernatural? If that's up to you, because that's what you have to do. God. That's Damn what it. you're basically saying. You're basically saying I don't have to demonstrate my cause because I'm just going to label it look supernatural. So I don't, I'm not. There is no burden on me to demonstrate the cause. All I have to do is say I don't accept the natural explanations, and that makes it supernatural. And that's incorrect. You have not demonstrated no, no, no. there is supernatural at all. No, 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 no. No, I'm I'm saying that if I have gone Fuck through off. every possible way that it have a naturalistic claim. How do you know you've gone through every possible way that it could be naturally explained? How do you know this? How do you know that there's okay. not a natural every explanation you haven't way, overlooked? It. Every possible God, way that can be explained in this way. So then if I've gone through every possible way that I can yeah. imagine and Fuck anybody it. else is and is still doing the same thing. And you still have to demonstrate your supernatural exists or you cannot just simply say you would just have that point. Oh, damn it. The only honest thing would be to say I don't know what's causing this. Okay, but what if that is evidence of the supernatural? It's not. It's evidence that you don't know what's causing it. Do you know that that's not evidence that's crossed? That, that yes, crossed because that evidence, that's evidence that's of the supernatural would demonstrate the supernatural actually exists. If you can't demonstrate the supernatural exists, and you say, I've tried every natural explanation I can think of, you are left with, I do not know what is causing this because we have no no demonstration that there really is a supernatural. And all the natural explanations we have exhausted, and we still do not have an answer. God, the answer does not just default to supernatural. That's ridiculous. God. Damn it. Yeah, okay, but it does warrant investigation. Yes, I would, I would love to investigate, and I would love to find evidence if there is supernatural so that we could start examining how the supernatural God functions and it. how it causes God things. That would be a really stunning thing to discover. Oh, God okay, all right, all right. Well, there, that's what I'm saying, right? So I'm saying, fine, you don't get to just jump to the supernatural, but you can't say, let's it. investigate and look at and see if this has got a supernatural cause. I think anybody would, would want to investigate God something that they don't understand or don't know. If I don't know what's causing something, investigating is God absolutely the proper step. Okay. All right, God so that is the, the process. Like, don't just think I jump on Christianity one day. Like, seven years from 92 to 99, where I looked at it from all different perspectives and sides, and then finally I said, okay, I'll give it a try. But it didn't just end there. God like, I'm giving you my first life experience with it, but I'm just trying to let you know that I did go through this whole process. And so, like, I put it to the test, I tried God it, I looked at it from various different perspectives, and... Yeah, so, um... It, First off, where does your personal experience inform you about something that happened at God the fucking beginning of the universe? I mean, I mean, God it, you say it, it doesn't just re relate back to Christianity, God but if I told it. you God that I invented a time machine God and I created the universe, would you believe me? Um, Mark, well, Mark I went back in time. Probably not. Okay, then do I have the same? I, can you? Am I on the same level as your God? Goddamn motherfucker! Can, would you say that it's equally likely that Eric created the universe and my God created the universe? God damn it! Well, like I said, if you can show me a time machine, then fine, I'll say all right. I believe Fuck that. It. Okay, so can you that have the same standard evidence for your God? Slut. Um. Well, I sort of do. Now, fuck a You do. God damn it. Okay. Yeah. Then now fuck a bit movie. But this is a pure personal life experience. Now fuck a bit. Yeah. Now fuck a bit. And I I think that the underpinnings of that. Now fuck a bit movie. Now fuck a bit movie. This poem right here. Um. I also think that um, when it comes to talking about things that you don't understand, right? Tracy had it absolutely right. It's saying I don't know. Like that's that, that's where you stop. Stupid you know, you stop doctor. trying to come up with answers when you don't have answers, and you say I don't know, and you continue to investigate. And if you don't know, and you don't know by the time you die, you leave it for the next generation to pick up. 
You don't just get to say, you know, my God or Eric went back in time and created the universe. So when you called in, you were saying that you're not convinced that God didn't create the universe. That doesn't really seem like a, a, a great way to start. I mean, how about I don't know how the universe was created or if it was created. I mean, really, wouldn't that be the more honest thing to say? Bucker. Hmm. Interesting. Okay. Um. Because otherwise, I'm gonna open my own church. <laughs> Interesting. Come on, you slut. I see. Yeah. I, I mean, uh, Mark. I want to say first of all, I appreciated your last call, and I appreciate this call. We do have some other callers. Um. But I, I thank you for your input, and you it's always interesting. Fucker. So. Um, if it's okay, we'll go ahead and, and, and kind of hold on that. Stupid you can think about bunker. that, maybe call back another time. Stupid! And, and come up with, you know, your, your ideas on it. You don't have to respond at this moment. Um, and we'll go ahead and move on to some other calls, if that's all right. Yeah, sure. Okay, well, thank you. Come on, you bitch. Come on, you stupid bitch. You stupid fucking bitch. Come on, you stupid bitch. God damn it. 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 God. God damn it. Stupid fucker. God damn it. 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 God fucking damn it. No. God damn it. Ah, oh, with Spitster. She's cute. Man, she got some spit arms. She's cute. With a spit. God damn it. Now fuck up and take that poem. Damn, I'm fucking you up. Hmm.
And I'm fucking her up. She's bringing out that whore. God damn it. I could have on for some of the fuck out of her. God damn it. God damn it. God damn it, I fucked up. Cause that was fucking stupid. God damn it. 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 God fucking damn it. God damn it. God damn it.
God damn it. Come on, you goddamn motherfucker. God damn it. God fucking damn it. I wonder if my arm is longer. Was pit? Come on, you goddamn motherfucker! Come on, you goddamn motherfucker! God damn it! These fucking pawns in the way. God damn it. Stupid! Ah! I fuck her. Now fuck up and overlook this. <sighs> bitch suck my dick, bitch. Yeah, she was a very good sport. I just outsmarted her. I just outsmarted the fuck out of her. And I um something the fuck out of her. What the fuck? Well, fuck you too. Well, fuck you too, you slut. Well, fuck you too. God damn it. God damn it. You see, that is, that is fucking pisses me off. God damn it. I didn't want to do that fucking shit. God damn it. Suck 
my slut. Motherfucker trying to Janet has oozy arms me. God damn motherfucker. God damn it. God damn it. God damn it. One of those fucking pieces of God damn it. Stupid! Because that was stupid. Because that was stupid with a capital S. God damn it. God damn it. Maybe I can get a fucking stillmate. Yes, I am a dog. Damn, let the starter begin, you slut. I just shit in my pants.
God fucking damn it. God damn it. The motherfucker's trying to jet has Uzi on me. Man, this is bullshit. God damn it. It's time, to gen, it's time to Jen as Uzi arms you. Jen as Uzi arms. I'm getting in your business. I'm getting in your business, you slut. Damn, I'm fucking you up. Damn, I'm fucking you up. Here's HO An adorable female. Oh, I love. Damn, I fucked that guy's butt. I fucked his butt. Now fuck up and overlook this. <laughs> ah! Now fuck up and resign before your time runs out. To you, you waffle. I fucked his. Oh, dumbass! You should have let the time run out, dumbass fucker. Now let's see if I can put his black ass in checkmate for the game.
They, you mean I came in I, I, and placed, I, I came in the 18th place out of the 17? Man, how fucking pathetic am I? Okay, last game. Win, lose, draw, glitch, ban, and abort, internet, go out, or one fuse to rematch. Whatever else can go wrong. Son of a bitch.